All right. Now here in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I've touched on this passage in previous sermons, but um, one of the things that we see here is the Apostle Paul is writing a church at Thessalonica and he's trying to uh, be an example to them. And what we see here is the, is the fact that he's working and one of the problems that they had here is that some people in the church weren't working. Right? And he says they're being busybodies. They're working not at all. And they're, they're just getting involved in, in sin because they're not working. And he even goes as far as to say, you know, withdraw yourselves from these people that don't follow our method of what, you know, what we've already shown you, that you need to work hard. You need to work. You need to provide for yourself. He says here, in let's, just, let's reread part of this passage. Look at verse number 6. It says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So he starts off saying, look, if someone's walking disorderly, withdraw yourself from that person. But then he goes on to explain what it means to be disorderly. Because it says, you know that we weren't disorderly among you. You know how we behaved ourselves. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8 says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. He said, We didn't just come in and freeload on you. He says, But wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. He said, We're not trying to be chargeable to you. We're, we're working with our own hands so that we can eat. And we're providing this example of working hard. Verse number 9, Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. So he's explaining here, they had the power, rightfully so, in order to receive money for the work that they were doing for the Lord and for these people ministering unto them. It was totally reasonable and right and scriptural for them to have received money for the work that they're doing. So he's, he's not saying that they couldn't do that, but the whole point of doing what they were doing was to give these people at Thessalonica an example because they had people in the church that, that weren't working at all. So he said, well, we're going to give you an example on how to do this. We're not going to take any money from you. We're still going to minister to you, and we're going to provide for ourselves and show you that all of these things can be done. Verse number 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. The pretty simple command, right? Oh, you don't want to work? Well, have fun then, because we're not going to give you any food. We're not going to let you freeload off us. You're able to work, you're capable of doing it, and you're not going to go out and, and work, you're not willing to go out and work, then have fun trying to find some food. If you're not going to work, then you're not going to eat. You say, that sounds harsh. Well, that's, that's the Bible. I don't think it's harsh. I think it's good. Because you don't want to enable people to be lazy. We ought to be hard workers. Look at verse number 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. So remember, in the first part, he was talking about we need to walk orderly, and if someone's walking disorderly, to withdraw yourself from that person. <laughs> For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. So the people who aren't working, but are just busybodies, getting involved in other people's business, gossiping, whatever, because they don't have a job to go out to, go to and do some work, He's saying, you need to withdraw yourself from people like that. Verse 12, Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So this is a command he's given them, and he's commanding them under the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. We command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Now, we're gonna, what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is... A pretty simple but, but applicable sermon, hopefully, for everybody. And that has to do with just working, finding a job, holding a job, what type of job to get, you know, to, for, for everybody, for all different situations. Because it's evident that God wants us working, that God doesn't want us idle, that God doesn't want us getting involved in sin because we're not busy. We need to keep ourselves busy. I touched on this a week or two ago on idleness and how important it is to make sure you stay busy with your time and you don't just have a whole bunch of free time that's not filled up with something to do. Because the, the more idleness you have, the more sin you're going to get into. And the problem that they had here 
is that some people just weren't working at all. But on the flip side, we're getting into this too, is that some people work too much. Some people focus way too much time on working for that physical bread and not enough time working for the Lord. Both things are a problem. When you, when you can't get unbalanced in our life, as much as, you know, because you can hear a sermon like this or you read a passage like this, right? It says, well, I need to make sure I get to work. And amen, right? I don't want to be like, I don't want to be worse than an infidel. As the Bible says in 1 Timothy um, chapter 5, verse number 8, you can turn it if you like. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Someone who's, who's an infidel means their you know, fidelity is like faithfulness, it's faithful. Infidel means you're not faithful. It's people who don't have faith. I mean, you should know what an infidel is anyways, but that's where the word comes from. It's people who don't have faith. Unbelievers. It says you're worse than, than, than someone. You know, you're not providing for your own household, men. You're worse than an unbeliever. You need to provide for your own household. And... Uh, so you can hear and read passages like this and say, wow, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. And you shouldn't. You know, no one wants to be that guy. Let's, let's work hard. But then as you work and work and work, sometimes what happens is you start conflating what is necessary, what is providing for, with a whole bunch of extra extravagance as being a need, right? Especially in such a, a, a blessed society that we live in a lot more things start to become what we consider to be needs that aren't really needs, right? The extra vehicles, the extra houses, the, the toys, the cars, the whatever, you know, all this stuff. Well, I need to have this and I need to have that. And when you start following that end, you can keep working, 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 working in order to provide, to provide all of those things. And you end up not working for God because you get too wrapped up into the cares of this world. And we're going to go into that a little bit more near the end of the sermon, but I'm just kind of giving you an outline here of what we're going to be dealing with. Because both are important. We need to work hard. And when it comes to working, it's also important to figure out what type of work we should be doing. Now we saw um, that in 2 Thessalonians 3, how people were not working and became busybodies. Right? Um, when it comes to what type of job we should pursue to keep busy with, this is going to be different for men and for women. This is going to be different for children and for adults. Everybody needs to make sure they're not idle. But look at what the Bible says. You're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 3, uh, 5. Excuse me. 1 Timothy 5, hopefully. You're there for verse number 8. Look at what the Bible says, how younger women can avoid being busybodies. By being idle, being busy by it. Verse number 13 says, And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So, in general, God's will is that women would be in that role of a mother. You marry, have children, guide the house. That's what, I mean, that's how God designed a woman to be. I mean, that, that's the functionality that he gave physically to women. He gave them the ability to, to bear children. He gave them the ability to feed the children, to nurture the children, all these great attributes that God has given that men can't do, that only women can do. It's a specific job and a specific function for women to do. And I'll tell you what, one way to keep busy as a woman and get married and have children, that'll keep you busy. At least if you got your priorities right, it will. If you're not letting your house go to hell and letting your children go off to the devil and just letting things, whatever, yeah, then you might end up having some idle time because you're not doing the actual job that you're supposed to be doing. But if you, if you get yourself in a situation and you get married, you start having kids, that will keep you busy. That's going to keep you from being idle, from being a busybody. Um, 
I believe that men need to be the primary provider. That's what the Bible teaches, that God is, just as he's designed women to be able to bear children and, and do that type of uh, work, he's designed men to be stronger than women, to have strength, physical strength, to be able to go and do more type of work. Uh, in general, work with your hands, work out in the field, work to bring in the, the provision that your family needs. That's how God has designed men to be. Just as in that verse 8 that we, we read previously, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith. He has. So it is a man's job to go and, and provide for his family. It's worse than an infidel. Now, I will say this, because I do believe this uh, is true. Definitely, women have different stages of their life. And not necessarily every single woman is going to get married. Just as the Apostle Paul was an unmarried man, there's going to be some women that end up not getting married with their life. Now, I think still primarily that women ought to be provided for, and the way that God has outlined it is, they go from being provided for by their father to their husband if and when they leave the house. And the Bible explains that women ought to leave the house, or men, you know, men and women, leave the house in order to get married. Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. That's the reason for leaving home, is to, is to cleave to your, to your spouse. Because you need that accountability. Now, I'm not going to get into all of that reason. That could be a whole another sermon for another day. But the Bible teaches, you know, that, that you know, and I'm going to do the same thing with my daughters. My daughters will be provided for by me. I'm going to go out to work, and I'm going to make sure they're, that they're cared for. And my, and my sons, I'm going to teach and train up to do more of the type of work like I do. More of the type of work. It doesn't have to be my trade, but just the type of work, of working with their hands to be able to provide for their family. And the girls are going to learn how to work at home, and to be a keeper at home, and to do those types of things, and things that God designed women to do. Now, as women go through different stages of their life, you know, God's design, uh, as, as I mentioned, to be taken care of by the fathers, by the husbands, financially. But uh, if a woman gets a job, I believe it shouldn't, first of all, it shouldn't interfere with the responsibilities at home. Because God, if, you, if you're married and you have children, God's plan is for you to be watching over and keeping that house. So it shouldn't interfere with all of those responsibilities. That's first and foremost. Also, I don't believe it's right for women to be in authority over men. And this is even if you're not married. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, you can turn there if you'd like, just flip back. Uh, page or two, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 11, the Bible says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now again, in the context here, it's just talking about um, women learning scripture, learning the Bible. It says, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And this is, this is going deeper to the authority structure that God has laid out. I don't believe that women should be judges like we have, you know, in, in the United States, where they, they're, they're in a position of authority to make the judgment call over, over everybody, over men and women. And um, it references here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. It says, well, Adam was first formed and then Eve. And if you remember, God made Adam in the image of God. And then he created woman out of man to be in help meet for him. That was the purpose of providing a woman, to be a help for Adam, because Adam had a job that God wanted him to do, and the woman was there to provide help so that Adam could get that job done. She's in the supporting role. That's the position that God's given her. It doesn't, it doesn't mean she's less important. She's very important. She's critically important because Adam needed that help. Men need that help. Men need that support. To get, to get the work done. And it's just like, it, it's very similar to what I was preaching last week about the church being a body consisting of different members. And now every member is really important. Everybody serves a function. Everything needs to be here in order for the body to function properly. Well, in order for, for the man to do the work that God has for him to do, he's going to need support. He's going to need help. He needs to help meet for him. And uh, that's what God provided but then also God provided the authority structure as well. 
But the husband is always the head of the household. And similarly, in, in general, not, it's not that a man has authority the same way a husband has authority over a wife. But God has designed for men to be the leaders and to be in charge when it comes to other areas of life, right? To be, to be the, the bosses, the ones that are the ones in charge, that are delegating and giving responsibilities. That's just the way that God designed men. And again, I'm not going to get too far uh, into that because I want to focus more just on the job aspect. But there is some things that we do see in Scripture as far as women working. It's all about you know, working and the different roles for women, for men, what types of jobs you should have, and using biblical principles to determine these things. Right? If you're a young single woman, or if you're an older single woman, or if you're, you know, whatever, you're married, what types of things could you do, should you do, uh, what type of biblical principles do we apply in that situation? And we'll get to men here in, in a little bit. But um, there are things that women can do to have a source of income. I don't believe it's wrong for that, for sure. The Bible talks about, you know, midwives. We, I've gone over that a couple few weeks ago. And um, I believe women's health issues and things like that are probably best handled by other women. That there's certain areas that it, it only makes sense that, that when women have issues, they should seek out help from, from other women. And you can have women filling that role, women who are older in their, in their life that don't have as many responsibilities of rearing young children. You don't have to do that anymore to, to keep you busy, so now you can move on to doing other things and having other work. You're still under authority of your husband. You can still keep the home, and you can provide service like this where it's not going to interfere with your other duties and tasks. But if you're in a position where your duties and tasks at home are limited because you're not in that stage of your life, there are I totally believe that it's, that it's perfectly fine for women to go out and get these types of jobs. Um, the Bible also talks about the virtuous woman, Proverbs 31, that she works with her hands and that she is rearing her children and everything else, but she delivers her goods unto the merchantman. So in the process of taking care of her house, she's making clothing, she, she's got a vineyard, she's keeping it, she's, she's kind of managing a lot of things at home. Well, if God's blessing you, you're getting an abundance and she's able to, while she's making clothing for her family, able to make a few extra things, Send that off and sell it. Yes, absolutely. It's not taken away from anything that's being done at home. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. But we want to just make sure that we fall within the principles that God is laying out here. So in general, uh, those are the types of things that we can look at for, for you know, women in their, in their situations. I don't think it's right that uh, a, woman, a woman should be forced, though, to have to go out and get a job. Because that responsibility falls on the men to take care of their own household, whether it be a father or a husband. But not everyone's in that situation. Some women don't have, you know, their father's passed away or they're, you know, they're not married or they're, you know, whatever. There's a lot of different situations out there. So, uh, you know, we need to fall back on other biblical principles to be able to uh, do things the best that you can with the situation that you're in. Right? Now, turn if you would to Luke chapter 3. I want to touch more on just different types of jobs that you can get. I know a lot of people have these, these questions. I have these questions, and, and you know everyone has to figure this out for yourself, but what type of job should I have? What type of job should I get as a Christian? Because there's definitely some jobs that you shouldn't have as a Christian, as someone who's a believer. Jobs that maybe you had before you got saved because you didn't know any better, or because you didn't have a problem with it, but now that you're saved, now that you see what the scripture says, you need to start rethinking your career choice and, and get into areas where uh, you're going to be right with God. There are jobs out there that are going to make you sin. The bottom line is, if you're, gonna, if, you're put, if you're in a position, if you're in a job that's going to make you sin against God, you need a different job. You need to go somewhere else. For example... The Bible tells us very clearly not to be partakers in other men's sins and that, you know, when it comes to just things like alcohol, right, not to even look on the wine when it, when it giveth its color in the cup or it moveth itself aright, 
and, and things like that. So if you're a bartender and you're helping other people to get drunk, which is a sin, and you're a partaker with their sins, you're taking their money and you're giving them booze, and you're pouring it, you're looking at it, you're serving it all day, you're around this booze, you need to get another job. Because you're you you are participating in that sin of that person. You say, yeah, but if I don't do it, someone else will. Okay, but that's on them. You say, well, if I don't kill this person, someone else is going to kill a person. I, <laughs> that's stupid. There's no justification. Just because someone else might do something wrong doesn't mean that you should do something wrong. Ever. That's never a good excuse. I've heard people use that excuse for so many different things. Like, you know, when it comes to drugs, if someone wants to get drugs, you're going to get them. I might as well make some money at this. No. Let them get them. I've heard, I've heard people say that before. <coughs> they're just trying to justify what they're doing. Why? Because they're greedy. They just want the money. Because they don't have the values. They don't have the principles. They just say, no, I'm not going to do this. A real simple one, you know. Maybe you shouldn't be working at that strip club. Right? You say, well, I'm just a bouncer. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you should find a different job. Okay, that's wicked. And that, that goes without saying. But there's plenty of other jobs, too. And we'll get into that a little bit. But I want to I read this passage in Luke chapter 3. Because... What we see here, it's actually some people coming up to John the Baptist. John's out in the wilderness. He's baptizing people. Right? So people are getting saved and baptized under the ministry of John the Baptist. And then people start asking him questions. Well, hey, what should we do? Let's read that passage. Because he's talking to people in specific jobs. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now I'm going to pause here because I, it's important for the whole context of the passage who John is talking to and what he's talking about before we get on to the next passage. Because you can see there in verse number 10, it says, and the people asked him, saying, so there's two different groups of people here. First, he's just speaking to the multitude that comes forth. There's a lot of people that came forth. But as he's speaking in general to the whole crowd, he's targeting false prophets that are there. And that is evident just in the words that he's using. He's not targeting every single person that showed up, even though he's speaking to the mass of the whole crowd. What he's saying is targeting a specific section of the people that are there. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out to see what John the Baptist is doing. And, and they came to ask him questions and whatever else, and to see what's going on in his ministry. And that's what he's talking about. He says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from wrath to come? <clears throat> and then it says here, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Now this sermon is not about repentance, but I just want to point this out here, because people get tripped up on this verse sometimes. And people who believe in works-based salvation will always turn to this passage, this passage or passage like this, where they say, see, look, there's try, he's telling them that uh, you know, they need to show and prove that they're saved, that they've repented, and the only way you can see and prove that they're saved is that they repented of their sins. Right? We need to see that they stopped sinning, then that means they're truly saved. That's the type of interpretation they're going to get from this verse. But if you just read the verse for what it says, it explains itself. First of all, he's talking to false prophets, not just everybody, not everyone that's showing up to be saved, because it says in verse number 9, he's talking about trees bringing forth fruit. And we can compare this with other passages, we can compare this with Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus is saying, you shall know them by their fruits, and he's talking about false prophets, identifying false prophets. So compare this passage in Luke 3 with Matthew chapter 7, you'll get that reference. But verse number 9 there says, And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Again, you can, you can start going around the Bible and see all the different parallel passages talking about trees and fruit, bringing forth fruit. And he's talking to false prophets that bring forth bad fruit. But what he says to them is, Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. So what type of repentance is he talking about? Well, he says, And begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. These people are trusting in their genealogy. They're trusting in the fact that they're a physical Jew for their salvation. That's what they're trusting. He says, 
Don't, don't think to say, we have Abraham to our father. Christ said, God is able these stones to raise up children on Abraham. That means nothing. But to them, it meant everything. They looked on the Jews of Jesus' day, and many of the Jews today are the same way. They looked at the Gentiles, they looked at other people as lower people, as people rejected of God, as people basically who were like reprobates, and that because their God shows the people that they get their pass into heaven because they're God's people, because they're a child of Abraham, because God made this problem to Abra promise to Abra Abraham, and we're a child of Abraham, so we just automatically get in there. And that's what you know a lot of the New Testament deals with, is that false concept that the Jews had of physically being a seed versus spiritually being a seed, that, that whole difference. But when he says bring forth really fruits worthy of repentance, he contrasts that with their belief in being a son of Abraham. The repentance that they needed was to stop trusting in the fact that they're physically a child of Abraham and to put their faith in Jesus Christ, to get saved, to put their faith in the right place. That's the bottom line. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about seeing some proof that they really believe and looking at their works. That's not what he's asking for right here at all. He says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Because he then says, don't say this within your heart. It's their belief that he's challenging. But now after he says this, after he addresses these false prophets, now people come to him and says, and we will ask him saying, what shall we do then? What shall we do? And he, he answered and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So now he's starting to teach them, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Do, help people out. After you get saved, after you get baptized, what should we do? Are obeying God's law. It makes sense. It fits. Verse number 12. But now he's going to get more specific because so there's certain people that come to him that are in specific jobs. So these people get saved. Now, if you if you remember, we're going to see here an example of a publican. In the Bible, you often see publicans and sinners. Right? Publicans and sinners came to Jesus. And, you know, and, and Jesus would get mocked and ridiculed because he sat and ate meals with publicans and sinners. A publican was basically like a tax collector. We see that uh, Levi was one of the people that, that Jesus said, hey, follow me. He sat at the receipt of custom. Custom was a taxes. It's like you know, customs, duties, right? He was sitting there receiving taxes from people. And he called him to follow, to follow him. This is a legitimate job that people can have. But what often happened that, in people that had this job was that they would take a little bit more for themselves, right? They're the taxman. They had the authority to go and collect this money from people. So they were taking the, 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 the tax for the government and then a little side personal tax for themselves. And you see that in what Jesus said to him. He says, because when the publicans came to him, it says, verse number 12, then came also publicans to be baptized. Now, if they're getting baptized, doesn't that show most likely that they got saved? I mean... You, you can't see all of their hearts, but the, the understanding here is that they got saved and now they want to be baptized. They came to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? Well, what should we do? We're publicans. And they're looked down upon and people hate them. So what does he say? He says unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. So as the tax collector, it's appointed unto them from their boss, hey, this is how much this person needs to pay. This is their tax. This is what they owe. Go and collect that. And he's saying, don't collect more than what you've been told that they need to pay and just you know pocket the rest. Because that's something that was apparently really easy for them to do, and that's also why they were looked down upon. Right? Because there's a lot of shady people out there getting that job, getting the authority to take money from people and basically become an extortioner and, and extort money from people, money that they don't even owe for their own gain. And then we have another example here of, of soldiers. So military men. Right? They're saved now here, these people. It says, and the soldiers likewise demanded them, saying, and what shall we do? Okay, you answer the publican, you tell them, okay, they need to, to be honest at their work. What do we do? And he said to them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So he tells them three things. One, do violence to no man. You say, well, wait a minute, how can they still be a soldier and do violence to no man? Well, 
There's a difference in the morality of self-defense and bringing evil upon someone because, and when I say evil, you have to understand the, the definition that the Bible says we use is bringing harm, like bodily harm to somebody else. If someone were to be guilty of a crime that's a capital crime and they need to be put to death, the person executing the judgment is doing evil upon that person. It doesn't mean they're wicked. It doesn't mean the person doing the, doing the execution is wicked. It doesn't mean that they're not right, but they are bringing evil. That, that's why the Bible says that God brings evil upon people. Because when God judges a country, judges a nation, judges a person, he's inflicting harm to them. So it's not that God is bad, because today we associate evil with bad, right? And in a sense it's bad because no one likes being, having a, you know, harm brought to you. But it's not bad in a moral sense. Like God isn't bad for judging someone. The person carrying out execution isn't bad. So he brings evil upon that person. Now, Soldiers can do the same thing. When the children of Israel were commanded to go out and inherit the promised land and destroy the people, they were bringing evil upon them, but they were right with God. They were justified in their actions. Everything was justified. When someone comes and, and tries to, to kill you or your family, you defend yourself or you defend your family, you're justified in whatever, you know, in the action that you have to take. If someone loses their life in the, in the process of you defending your life, and I'm not going to go through all the scriptures on that either, but the, but the Bible is pretty clear about that also. And when Jesus said, hey, you know, sell your garment and get a, get a sword, you know, it wasn't just for show and tell. It wasn't just to hang on a wall, okay? He was telling them that, hey, when I was with you, you didn't have to worry about anything. But now I'm going, you need, to, you need to be able to protect yourself. But I'm not going to go any further than that. <clears throat> the whole point, I'm getting a little, bit, a little bit sidetracked here. All of that being said to explain what violence means, because violence comes from the word like violate. When you violate someone, like a woman is violated if, if a man forces a woman. That's a violation against that woman. It's a pretty serious violation. Um... When soldiers in wartime go in, they do a lot of, oftentimes, violate the people and the land that they're going and fighting. Now, they should just be fighting the soldiers and fighting that battle, but what happened, I mean, you hear reports of this in Vietnam, you hear reports of every war. Every war has these types of problems where soldiers will go in, and because they, uh, there's, there's no one else maybe to fight against them, they have this extra power. They feel they can do whatever they want. And they'll you know, rape and pillage a town or whatever. That's violating those people and is not right. They're doing violence to those people. And as a soldier, Jesus is saying, don't do violence to people. That's wicked. That's evil. That's wrong. Don't do that. And then he says, uh, don't accuse any falsely. Don't lie. I mean, think about how many lies there are, too. Just... There's not many people around, right? You're in a battle, you're in a war, and you want to cover yourself and, and you know, whatever. He says, don't, don't accuse anyone falsely. Um, and then also he says, be content with your wages. And soldiers typically don't earn a lot of money. You know, something that people do because they're in a situation, in general, not everybody, but a lot, oftentimes people are in a situation where they need to make money, they don't really know what to do, they don't have any skills, so they say, well, I'll go and... and and fight. You know, I could, I could fight. I could, I could fight a war or whatever. And they get paid whatever they get paid to go out and fight. But it's, it's not always a lot. So Jesus is saying, hey, be content. Whatever, whatever you got, be content with it. Now notice, in both of these situations, what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, quit your job and go get a new one. So you know what that tells me is that being a publican or tax collector and being a soldier are not inherently wicked jobs that you have to quit. Now, I will say this, though, as I mentioned earlier, we're getting into this a little bit too, if you, ha if you are in a position where they're forcing you to, or want to force you, or say, if you don't do this, you're going to lose your job, well, you still follow Jesus. Like if they said, a commanding officer tells a soldier, no, you go in and you do this to that person, and you're going to do violence to them. You know what you do in that situation? You listen to Jesus. 
And if they fire you, they fire you. If they say no, then, then you're out of here, then you're out of there. But you listen to Jesus first and say, what should we do? That's what we should do. You do what Jesus said. And unfortunately today, with given, given the way that our, that our country is, the way our military works, I don't think the military is a good place for anyone to get involved in because what you end up doing is you're, you're making a deal that, see, this isn't always the way things have always been, but you're, you're basically signing your life away. And, and in a sense, you're practically signing your sovereignty away, like of your ability to make choices and stuff to the government when you join the military in the United States today. And it's kind of like, well, what are you going to end up being put in? You're putting yourself in a bad situation, a bad position where you might have to go back on a, on a promise or about You sign a contract, you read your contracts. Read what they're telling you that you're signing up for. Don't just think, well, I just need the money, so I'm just going to sign whatever. Your word should mean more to you than money. That's the way we ought to. I mean, look at God's word. How important is it for God's word to stand? It means everything. It means everything. God's word is what saves us. If there is some flaw, if, there, if God's word was corruptible, we'd all be doomed. God's word is important. Our word should be important too. And when you sign documents, you sign statements, and this is what I'm going to do, it's like, it's like a vow, it's an oath. It's a covenant. We all take that seriously. And if you have a job that's requiring you to sign something like that, and then it's going to put you, open yourself up, that's just not why. You open yourself up to, to saying, I'm going to obey this, and I'm going to do this, and you're going to tell me where to go, and I, you know, whatever. Whatever it says, read it. It's not wise to open yourself up to then putting yourself in those situations. And unfortunately, the government is putting people in situations today that are not justified, that are not right. And uh, personally, I don't think people should do it, but you know, the, use the biblical principles to determine for yourself what's right. <laughs> and there's, there's many other situations uh, like that. But here we see there are jobs you can have, and these people just get saved. Um, and now they're saying, well, now what do we do? Because they know, they already knew that this stuff was wrong, but they're asking Jesus now, what can we get away from? What can we do? What should we do? And uh, maybe you're, you you got saved, you're in a job where, uh, well, here's, an, here's another example. Like, oftentimes sales jobs will get people to lie. Right? You work for, for a job where the company doesn't have very good ethics, where they don't really care about right and wrong, they just care about the bottom line. They'll instruct employees to lie. Well, the Bible says not to bear false witness. I mean, he told the soldiers not to bear false witness against anyone, right? If you're at a job that's requiring you to lie, you're going to have to say, if you're going to be right with God, you have to say, I'm not going to lie. And if you're going to force me to lie, then you're going to have to fire me or whatever. But I'm going to perform my job without breaking God's law. Without, you know, there, there, there should be none of that going on. Because God's law needs to have a priority in our lives. And if that means you lose a job, you lose a job. What's more important to you? Being right with God or that money that's coming in? Now... I don't want to hear people say, well, I need to provide for my Yes, you do need to provide for your, for your family, but that's not the only job that's out there. You don't have to take a wicked job. There's, if you're willing to work, you can provide for God will make sure that you can provide for your family if you're willing to work. And if you have integrity to keep God's word, God will dead sure make, make positive that you will be able to do that. No doubt about it. Men need to be able to make an honest living um, we we'll turn to Matthew chapter 6 the last place I'll be turning 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 21 says providing for honest things not only in the sight of the Lord but also in the sight of men we need to be honest we need to provide for honest things when we go to work not only in God's sight but also in man's sight and then the Bible says in Proverbs 16 11 a just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are His work. And there's many other Proverbs and other places that talk about the just weight and the just ephah. And basically it's talk about where people would would uh, falsify their, you know, they're trying to make extra money. 
So they're saying, I'm selling you one pound of grain or whatever. And the way they do it, they have balances. So you put something that's a known weight, one pound on this side, and then we're going to even it out to whatever you're selling on this side. And what people do is say, oh, yeah, see, look, this is labeled one pound, and it's really um, 0.9 pounds. Right? So it's lighter. So they're giving you less than what they're saying they're giving. It's just lying. It's what it is. It's all, and, and you can read that in the Bible. Obviously, God's against lying. And the Bible says, better is little with righteousness than, than much gain without righteousness. That's, it's way better to make little, say, but I'm only making this much of my job. You know what, that's a lot better if you could do it righteously, if you could be right with God and have integrity and do what's right. It's way better to make a lot less than it is to make a lot more money and do it deceitfully and do it through unjust gain. Because that's only going to hurt you in the long run anyways. Now, as I mentioned, you shouldn't work for a place that makes you be deceptive. You shouldn't work for a place that makes you sin. Um, you also shouldn't work for a job that's keeping you out of church. And this is going to go to your own priorities, but we see the priority that God puts on the church and how Jesus Christ shed his blood for the church and how uh, the Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Church ought to be a priority in our life. We need church. We need church not just listening to preaching online, not just, you know, reading your Bible at home. You need to be in church. Can't stress this enough. And so many people, they don't realize how important it is to be among the believers, to be among the brethren, to work together, to strive together for things that are good and for upright, and be around other people. You need that. And if you don't have that, you're going to slip. You're going to start backsliding. You're going to get out. And you're gonna, before you know you're getting in the world, you're not even going to know how it happened. Because you didn't put the priority on being in the house of God. It is important. Now you decide how often that is for you to be right with God. But God doesn't tell you you have to be in church X amount of days or X amount of hours in order to not sin. <clears throat> You don't have that. Just as much as we don't have how long a woman's hair needs to be in order to be considered long and how short a man's hair needs to be considered short. God doesn't give us that metric. But we do see this in the Bible that we need. Uh, it says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching as far as, as being in church and, and congregating together. That it's even more important to be among the believers as the world starts to get more wicked as the end times start approaching, as the signs of the Antichrist are coming. We need this more. More and more and more. I personally made the choice a long time ago that I won't work for any job that's going to make me miss any church. At all, ever. Because that's the priority I place on church. This is my top priority. In my family, God's at the top. You make that decision for yourself. I'm not going to condemn someone who works on Wednesday nights or whatever. You know, that's between you and God. I'm just telling you, you know, my decision making and just for you to analyze your own priorities in your life, what's important to you. And do your actions reflect what your priorities are? Is it really important? And are you using God's methods and, and, and God's ways or just trying to sub substitute your own ways for what God said is important and, and, and try to think that that's, uh, that's okay. You know, our job shouldn't take precedence over the things of God. Um, if your job prevents you from coming to church, you either need to change your schedule or change your, your job. I, I had the same, I had this actual very thing, it's in the process right now. I could be at work right now. I've been at work I was. I worked until 3 a.m. on Friday. I worked until 10 p.m. last night, from morning to night. And look, I'm not trying to boast. I'm just saying we're do, we're in the middle of something at work that requires. I mean, everybody's coming in. It's a big project. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's deadlines and stuff. But you know what? I said I'm not available on Sunday morning. I'm not available on Sunday evening. So if you're the pastor, for, well, yeah, of course I need to be here, but. I would say the same exact thing if I wasn't. Because that's my priority. And I don't care how good the job is. I don't care how much it pays. If they're going to say, well, you need to be here or else you're fired, then I'll say, see ya. 
Now look, I'm willing to work. I'll work different hours of the day, different hours of the night. I will provide for my family. I'll do what it takes. I'll work hard for an employer, but I'm not going to put them over God. I'm not going to put that over being a church. I won't do it. You know, I think God will bless you if you make that stand. Oftentimes people get too comfortable in a situation or in a job and maybe enjoy the work or you like your job. You don't want to, uh, you know, maybe you have a hard time even thinking you can get another job. Oftentimes a lot of people get kind of scared about that and say, well, yeah, I know, but I've been here for a while and there's this good deal. And you get so used to it, you don't really want to rock the boat. But there's always other jobs out there. I mean, I got real comfortable at my, at my previous job that I worked at for almost 15 years. It was comfortable before I got laid off. <laughs> it was real comfortable, but it was nice. And it was great, and I had no problems with it. But see, it didn't force me to have any conflict with obeying God's law or being in church or anything like that, so it was just fine. But there were times where I didn't really want to go out and seek another job because that one didn't pay as great as it could have for, for the job that I did. I understand that feeling of getting real comfortable in a position and not really wanting to change and not really wanting to move. But when it comes to either obeying God or being right with God, that should be a, that should really be a no-brainer. The decision making should come from what's the most priority in your life. And like I said, it doesn't mean you have to quit immediately, but start looking around, line up another job, transition, let that be your focus if if, if you have any of these problems. Now if you are just in direct sin with God, like if you're working at the strip club, quit today. <laughs> Don't go back to that job. Don't put yourself in a sinful situation. But if, if you're at a place where you can continue to work and not sin, then great. You know, you can still stay there and do what you need to do. But then, um, or if you're, you're, you know, you're not able to get to church very often, I, I would consider um, try to find another place to uh, to gain employment and still you know it doesn't mean you're not providing for your family you just make that change as soon as you can that's uh that's what i think would be the biblical approach to that now um i turn to matthew chapter 6 because we can't forget what jesus taught and we see in matthew chapter 6 this is what where our priorities should be it kind of sets us right because as i said before we, we have an imbalance of where we should be spending our time what should we be focused on? Verse number 19 in Matthew 6, the Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. So on the one hand, we have, if you're not providing for your own, you're worse than an infidel, right? That's a provision. But on the other hand, he's saying, don't be laying up treasures for yourself on earth either. You work enough, but you need to work to provide, but don't be caught up in laying up of treasures. It says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Someone has to come first. Someone has to come first. Is it your work or is it God? Is it your employer or is it God? Is it that money or is it God? The statement I just made is, you know what? I despise the work, the, the, the job, if it means I have to, to miss church. No, I'm going to cleave to God and love God. So I, can't, I can't be in two places at once today. I can't be at that other job and here. You know what? Right now I'm despising the other place because I love God and I'm going to be here. You can't serve God and man. You can't have two masters. Verse 25, therefore. So because of this, because you can't have two masters, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit 
unto his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if, <coughs> if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We're being taught the concept that... You don't have to fear. You don't have to be scared when it comes to making these decisions on faith. When you're putting God first, you say, you know what? I'm going to serve God. I'm going to make Him the priority. Everything will fall into place. Don't be worried about that job. God will make it happen so that you are provided for. If you're going to seek Him first. Don't put God on the back burner. Don't put Him second. Don't put Him last. Give him the priority. Seek those heavenly riches, and God will make sure that you have the food and the clothing that you need. Don't forget the whole purpose of having a job is to provide for your physical needs. Keep that in mind. Don't get distracted with amassing physical riches, because if you do that, you're going to end up wasting your life. Now, I think I've covered... Everything I wanted to cover, there's a few other passages that I have here. I'm not going to get into all of them, but um, I'll just give you a summary of these so we don't have to turn to all these passages. Being successful on the job. So you get in a job, you get a good place, you find a job that's going to be in line with your priorities, be in line with serving God. If you want to do well on your job, then you need to, um, <coughs> first of all, you know, Bible says in Colossians 3, verse number 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. It's basically a, a summary of what Matthew 6 says. Seek out the kingdom of heaven first. And then it says in verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And then verse 22, the Bible says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. When you have a job to do, do it well. Go out and give it your all. Give it your best. <coughs> do your work as if you're serving God. So it says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. You're a servant. You have a master. You have a boss. Work, work for them. Work real hard. That's the right thing to do. That's the Christian thing to do. It's a biblical thing to do. Whatever your job is, do it well. Put forth the effort. It says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. At the end of the day, what really matters is God's judgment anyways. God sees you doing right. God sees you doing well. Even if your boss isn't doing well to you, you're doing well to him, you know, by him or to him. God sees that. Let God judge. Let God lead. Let him make all the wrongs right. You just do what you're supposed to do. You provide for your family, but you seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Don't lack faith. Do what he said. If God's able to take care of all these creatures that he made. He's able to take care of you too. He knows your needs. Follow him. Do well. You do well on the job. You know what? You're going to end up getting the raises and promotions. You may not get them immediately, but over time, God will make sure you're taken care of as well. And if you're never recompensed financially, I would say even better. If you're putting in all of that work and you are just being upright, honest, working real hard, and you never see a financial blessing in this life for your hard work, God doesn't let any of your work go unrewarded. So I would say just take comfort in that. Because either one day you, you will end up being blessed for your hard work on this earth. But if not, you can be sure that God's going to bless you. He, he, he makes sure you, know, you, you reap what you sow. And when you're only sowing good and doing good things and doing right and working hard, you will reap from that. 
We saw um, one last example. I'll just leave you with this. And we're not going to look at all the passages. If you remember the, uh, the story of Balaam, where the king Balak was hiring Balaam to go and to curse the children of Israel. So here's, in a sense, you can look at this as Balak is like a boss, right? He's an employer. Because that's all he was doing. He was trying to hire this man to curse the children of Israel. And he's offering, he's saying, look, I'll give you whatever you want up to half the king. You know, he's, he's offering all these different rewards to him. saying, look, I can give you all this stuff. You just come and you just, you, you go against God in this situation. And multiple times he's saying, okay, just, just do this one thing for me. And of course, uh, Balaam doesn't do that. He doesn't curse him. I'm not saying, you know, Balaam was a false prophet. That's a whole other thing. But, the, but the, the, the symbolism here, the story that we see here is someone, you know, <clears throat> asking him to go against God. And we need to make sure that we won't do that for any, for any amount of money. No matter what, they're going to say, oh, you just, we've got this client coming in. You know, I've, I've heard this and I, I know this happens out there with single ladies at a job where the boss says, oh, we have this, this customer coming in. Take him out. Take him for drinks. Make sure that, that you buy his drinks and that he, you know, show him a good time. This means a lot to us, a lot of money. I don't care how much, we'll, we'll give you a bonus. We'll give you a commission on, on this if you just take him out and, and make sure that he's happy. And, you know, if it involves sitting, if it involves taking him out to a club, taking him out to a bar, getting him drunk or, or more or whatever, they're trying to get you to do because some employers are really filthy and they'll, they'll ask their young girls to go up and do, and do worse. That's not the place to be. We ought to obey God rather than men and, and don't let any amount of money allure you. It's not worth it. God's the one that gives promotions. The Bible says in... Uh, Psalm 75, verse 4, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly unto the wicked, lift not up the horn. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Promotion. You want that promotion? He's saying, don't look around you. What is he saying? It comes from the north. But God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. You don't have to worry about it. If you're, if you're doing right, if you're doing right by God, if you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, and you're working hard, just as the Apostle Paul gave the example, we labored and travailed night and day, that we wouldn't be chargeable to you, we worked hard. You know what? God's the one that's going to give the promotion. God's going to lift you up. God will take care of you. Let's bow our heads at a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all these great words of encouragement. God, I pray that you please give us strength and help us uh, in our day-to-day -day lives as we know that we do need to work, especially the men need to work to provide for their families and for themselves, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please help us all to be able to do so in a, in a godly way, in a way where we can uh, not be sinning for sure, and that we can still uh, prioritize our lives, that we are serving you and seeking first the kingdom of heaven, seeking first the kingdom of God, and not just seeking first all these other things. Uh, needs, dear Lord, but that we know we seek, we seek you first, that everything else will fall into place. Everything else will work out for us. Help us have the faith to just trust that completely, Lord. I know you've never let me down in any situation I've been in. As long as I've been serving you, dear Lord, you have always made everything work out. And I know you'll do the same for everybody because your word says so and that you are not a liar, Lord. I pray that you would please just help us all today to have a proper uh, heart to, to do that which is right. In your eyes, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.